as we get ready to explore the scientific aspects of yoga and consciousness over the next two days, it is my pleasure to welcome Founder President of the Satsang Foundation and also my Guru Sri M to deliver the keynote address today. Sir. Um. Kandamandalakaram vyaptam yena jaracharam tatpadam darshidam yena tasmai shri guru venamaha ajnana dimirandasya jananjanam shalakaya chakshuru miritam yena tasmai shri guru venamaha guru ramha guru vishnu guru devo maheshara guru sakshat parabrahm tasmai shri guru venamaha Brahmanandam Paramasugadam Kevalam Yanamurtim Dandwaditam Gaganasadarsham Tattvamasya Dilaksham Ekam Nityam Vimalam Achalam Sarvadi Sakshi Bhutam Bhavaditam Trigunarahitam Sadgurum Samnam Doubt said, thank you Dr. Rekha for introducing me and calling me, calling upon me to um, also thank you, Dr. Chandravash Narayan. Even if I forgot to say Narayana, there is Narayana here. here we go. <coughs> so um, I'm going to keep it very short about research. Now, Dr. Rekha said the ultimate aim is to discover the inner consciousness. Now, this inner consciousness this is the ultimate aim of yoga, which in the second Guru Mantra I expressed as Kevalam Jnanamurtim Dandvatitam without two opposites Dandvatitam Gagana Sadarsham like the sky Tattvamasya dilakshyam, the aim, when you discover it, you figure out that you are no different from that. Ekam, one nityam, always there. Ah, nityam, then. Vimalam, no mala at all, absolutely clean. Achalam, no movement at all. Achalam. Sarvatra Sakshi Bhutam, witness to everything that happens without undergoing any change. Bhava Atitam, having no bhavas, beyond bhava, not having no bhava, beyond bhavas. Triguna Rahitam, free of all three gunas, Sattva, Rajas and Tamas. That I worship as the Supreme Being, as a Supreme Teacher. So naturally, the research that we are going to look into, Certainly not into that consciousness, because we cannot put it into a test tube, we cannot test it, it's our own inner self. So that we can do nothing about. However, the reason why we don't understand this self, this Supreme Being, this consciousness, is because we are full of distractions, uh, mala, impurities, so when you're full of, how can you understand a nirmala when you're full of impurities, full of vrittis, full of agitations? So all that we can do in yoga, could be any yoga, okay, not only abhyasa yoga, is that you can attempt to clear the distractions and impurities and all the blocks that keep us away from that which is beyond. That much we can do. So therefore, this research that we are going to do in collaboration with the scientific institutions is quite different from the other research that happens. Because in other kind of research, you have tangible objects, padharthas to research with. Here we are dealing with something which is with the mind. Now there is one respite here, which is that the mind to a great extent depends on hormones. When you say I feel very nice in meditation, somehow 
through some way a little bit of uh, a hormone called serotonin has been released into your system. Or when you have visions, if you check somebody, there is a good amount of dopamine in the system. So while what we are looking at is beyond ordinary, beyond physical matter, it can lead us to that which is beyond while doing research in matter which is tangible. So this research, I'm because I don't know the practicalities of the research, because the research which we are going to do, I would say, is to go from the tangible to that which is intangible. Uh, now, when you come to therapy and so on, it's not so difficult because you can test a number of people together and see how they are functioning after the practice of yogic techniques. But we need to make sure that all the criteria that we adopt in this test is totally scientific if we are going to do research. There are other ways of doing that is different. Since we want the scientific community to sit up and take notice, <coughs> we need proper data. We need, when the mind is in a particular state, what is the activity going on inside the brain, for instance? When I say, I am in love, what is happening? Even though it's happening in the brain, my heart is thumping. What's happening in my heart? So, what I mean to say is that we have to be very careful and strict in our data gathering, data collection. So that when the results come out, no scientist would sit up and say, no, 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 this is all wrong experiment, this has not been done properly. So please make sure that it doesn't matter if you don't succeed in the beginning. My advice is, it doesn't matter, keep trying till you get something genuine. Because it's difficult to get genuine yogis also to experiment upon. So while if you can't experiment on others, make them sit down and meditate, take all the parameters that you get as a reaction from the brain, the EEG or whatever is there. And then compare it with someone, if you rarely find a good yogi, ask him to sit down and try. Yesterday, with the Sri Chitra Institute, they put some kind of uh, electrodes and did an EEG. Now, I want to tell you that the modus operandi of that experiment needs to be changed a little. Because you do it for 10 minutes and then they announce a number. Now you are deeply in meditation. And then you need to suddenly pull yourself out to remember the number. Because in the form you have to write that number, finally. And then, you know, these are not, we need to look at it. What is the modus operandi you need to adopt? You have to figure this out on how to do accurate research and how it might be different from researching on a material, strictly material object. Everything is material. Also, during anger, during uh, sex, during other uh, moods that a human being grows through, what are the parameters? And how does the yogi behave in these circumstances? Is it possible for the yogi to be Sarvatra Samabuddhaya, tranquil under all circumstances? Now, I think there is a possibility of collecting data. My, my suggestion is that all people involved in this research should read a beautiful book written by a mathematician who is no more late Mr. Martin Gardner. It's called, it is titled, you might get it in Oxford University Press. It's titled, Science, Good, Bad and Bogus. You see what happens? It's in a gathering like this, if I drop a few scientific words, then after that if I talk nonsense, everybody will lap the whole thing up. The reaction, because he has said some science, so it must be true. Right? And many teachers adopt that, you know that. Uh, so, we have to be very careful with this, that when we work on this, make sure that all the parameters are in place. Tomorrow, Martin Gardner shouldn't rise up from his grave and say, no, 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 no this is bogus science. True, stick true to your sciences, whatever you are doing. And believe me, if something is genuine, 
certainly it can be proved if it is seen now while people do research on the brain and try to find the eeg and all there is one extension of the brain which is very important in our yogic sciences in our nad sampradaya as well as in uh, that science which uh, our own shri narayana guru sang as adabambe di adabambe the kundalini <coughs> the snake so when you experiment i think don't just look at the brain also look at the extension of the brain in the spinal cord which is after all brain matter coming down from the muladhara to the sahasrara so don't just confine your practical research to the brain but also include the spine in this when we do chakra dharana so many changes happen in some parts of the spine in the brahmadanda inside which is the shushumna many changes happen we should also try and devise some way by which these can also be practiced now for instance the lowest center in the yogic uh, anatomy physiology slightly different from gray's anatomy and physiology is muladhara it's called muladhara because it is the root mula adhara root foundation that is your actual aadhar card actually it reflects all your emotions it knows exactly who you are it's there because most of our awareness for most people most of the time is only at the level of the muladhara now you can try and get some i don't know what you do to see it in the screen or to measure it in some way when somebody is meditating in the muladhara now try to get a person who know what they're doing for instance if you go to the kularnav tantra the shastras muladhara to describe now that description has to be visualized by the subject so that when you measure it it you will see some change muladhara is explained as <clears throat> lam bijam dharaning dhyayat चतुर्शंग सुविधम सुगंधम स्वर्णवर्णत्म आरोग्यम देहलाघ्यम दिस इज द डिस्क्रिप्शन इन द सूत्र नाउ वेन यू वेन समी फिक्स इज इज अटेंशन देयर हियर आर द क्राइटीरिया दैट यू नीड टू सी वन इज आरोग्यम एनी बडी हूज अटेंशन इज गिवन देयर इज हेल्थ नीड्स टू इम्प्रूव एट सम पॉइंट सो कीप लुकिंग एट हाउ इट वॉज नाउ एंड हाउ इट वॉज आफ्टर दे डिड इट फॉर अ एक्सटेंडेड पीरियड ऑफ टाइम देन sugandham all meditators who fix their attention in muladhara are likely to have some sense of smell heightened and get beautiful fragrance while in meditation this is the time to see if anything is happening to the nasal tissues which are causing these fragrances to be become anubhava to become ek so what i'm trying to say is first we need to on one hand to make a deep study of the tantras i have a suggestion there was one man who was retired uh, who retired took voluntary retirement from the british judicial services in central india and became a yogic seeker a tantra seeker now there is both kind of tantra there is also yoga tantra there is a vamachara he was in the yoga tantra side he did a lot of research on this and all of us who are going to do the research just to be familiar with the other side with science you are familiar with the other side is to read a book written by this man called introduction to tantra the name of the author is sir john woodroff he wrote under the pen name of author avlon his name was sir john woodroff uh it's one of the best expositions on what tantra actually is when you are experimenting with the brain sahasrara and with the whole spinal system it is part of yoga tantra it is the same author who wrote this wonderful book called the serpent power which describes the movement of the energies 
In English, there is no other book which is better than that because I'm sure you won't be reading the Kular Navatantra, Mahanirvana. We can do what we can. So all I'm trying to say is these, the researchers and you who lead the researchers should be familiar with medical science and medical experimentation, you're already clear. But please familiarize yourself with the other side so that when you put these two together, Martin Gardner will not say this is boga science. But we want something genuine. We want this data. And if there is data, anywhere in the world we can produce it and say, here you are. This is what we have. Experiment if you want. So this is my advice. And I think, what can a person who is not involved in the research, a common person, so-called, there is no common person, but so-called, can do is to join with the research team and allow people to research on their moods and sometimes even vagaries and all the thoughts that come into the system so that they can produce some kind of a data which would be very useful to Ayush. Ayush should not be just, uh, I think it should be international. It's a global thing. All human beings are global. The Vedas have said, Loka samasta sukhino bhavantu. May the whole world be happy. Sarve bhavantu sukhina. Everybody knows. Sarve shantu niramaya. That should be the aim. Sarve bhadrani pasyantu. Ma karchit dukhapad bhavet. May sorrow not touch anybody. This should be our prayer, even while we do this experiment. And beyond this, it's left to the researchers to figure out how to go about this and how to make accurate findings. Not easy. You can collect a lot of data and then slowly uh, kind of remove the, uh, the rice from the staff and clear it and show it. Uh, what we need are meditators. You can get instruments, but you cannot get meditators. So we need dedicated meditators who say, okay, I'm going to uh, what uh, dedicate myself to yogic research and I don't mind spending time on it. That is done. There's so much that can be, I don't want to expand on this, but there's so much that can be done. And tomorrow we can say that this country, this Bharat that we have is a treasure house of knowledge and wisdom which can be scientifically tested and proved. This should be there. With this, I, I, you're sitting there, you hear me what I'm saying. So I think this is very important that people sit up and take notice and say, my God, what is this wisdom that is there? Swami Vivekananda started it. This spreading or sharing the secrets of what we have with the West. And now we should... But please remember, Atmano Moksha Jagat Hitaya Atmas Moksha and goodness for the world. Keep these two things in mind, even while you do research. Thank you very much. Namaskar. <coughs> Om Shanti Shanti. I can't take questions now, this session. So I need to leave now. And I hope you continue to sit and enjoy the sessions. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I would have wanted to listen to Dr. Govalshan, but Next time, maybe in the afternoon session or something. Yes. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. I am happy to introduce Dr. S. Manjunatha. Uh, he is going to speak to us on introduction to research in yoga. He is actually currently holding a professor and the chair of Department of Physiology. Dr. B.C. Roy, Multi-Speciality Medical Research Center at one of the prestigious uh, IITs I, and the first IIT to be set in, in India, which is uh, Indian Institute of Technology, Kharagpur. He is also an 
adjunct professor of integrative medicine and research in KS Hegde Medical Academy, Nitte University, Mangalore. He also is a research collaborator with Endocrine uh, Research Unit at Mayo Clinic College of Medicine, Dorchester, USA. He, he is a true Kanadiga uh, from Hubli, and uh, he did his MBBS and M MD from Ames, New Delhi, and went on to do research, uh, research fellow and a senior research fellow from Mayo Clinic. He has been a wonderful teacher uh, from the beginning and is an outstanding uh, student uh, during his medical uh, studies. I will not extend that and there is a timer which has been put for facilitating you to uh, cut short if you are overshooting it. Sure. Thank you. Let's put a hand together and welcome. Namaskar. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, there has been a long introduction about me, and therefore I don't have to speak much about this. If you are, can you please switch off these slides? Yeah. Slides. Slides. Lights. Ah. Okay. The first is that I don't have any conflicts of interest to disclose. The only thing that I will be discussing for everybody's interest is that whatever I discuss is purely based on medical evidence. Before I have a background in medical science and then my MD in physiology. Physiology basically deals with how the human body functions. From All India Institute of Medical Sciences in New Delhi, the Department of Physiology of Ames has been uh, actually in the forefront of yoga research. The forefront from 1960s, we have been doing these studies. Therefore, I have also done a couple of research on yoga and therefore, I have been doing this for the last 20 years. Therefore, I have some idea. I won't say I'm an authority, but I'll try to summarize whatever I know of. So what we are looking at is yoga. But before that, we had to discuss a couple of things. We all know what health is. Morning, it was already discussed. It's a very comprehensive definition. That is, uh, it is a set of complete physical, mental, social, and spiritual well-being, and not merely an absence of disease or infirmity. If we go by the definition, we are all diseased, because none of us could mat or meet all those requirements. Which means that it brings us to the questions of diseases. There are different types of diseases. But as we know, there are three major types of diseases. That is genetic or environmental or multifactorial. Among the multifactorial, the most important of late have been the lifestyle disorders. Because of our lifestyle, we get to have certain diseases. And three of the most important we already are aware of is coronary artery disease, hypertension and type 2 diabetes mellitus. <clears throat> but now everything is multifactorial, everything has become lifestyle disorder, including cancers. Therefore, this definition no longer is valid anyway. Now that brings us to the question of yoga. Why are we talking about yoga and lifestyle disorders? There is a saying which says that yoga is the best lifestyle ever designed. Okay? Therefore, it is a kind of lifestyle. Now, is it beneficial to all these, uh, to treat or cure all these diseases or to have better health if we follow yoga, that we will have to see. But the moment you say uh, yoga, you hear a lot of things, okay? I mean, you would have heard or you would have read or you would have uh, seen people saying that yoga is panacea for everything, which means that it can mm, bring you complete health, cure diseases. All these things are actually told about yoga unfortunately, without much evidence. That is the biggest problem that we have. And I am not the first reference to say this. Therefore, in 1950s, one of the India's reasonably well-known chemists, he was in Allahabad University, and he has written a book on yoga called as Science of Yoga. He said, there is no subject which is so much wrapped up in mystery and on which one can write whatever one likes without any risk of being proved wrong. And this was told in 1950s. And even now it's true, therefore even almost a century from 1950, and this is true. And therefore, I would I mean, probably you can all, after going through this lecture, would look at any evidence that you see critically. Therefore, this is one of the books that he has written. He has many books to his credit, but this is one. Okay. So what I would be discussing in my talk today is, let's see what yoga is, because there are different definitions or types of yoga. We'll see that. And let's look at 
what the research has been in yoga, especially what is the current research trend, what is the quantity, and how is the quality of that research that has been done. Now, what are the limitations in these research findings that we have? And if there are limitations, what are the difficulties? Why is that uh, the research is so, what I can say, substandard or evidence is not that up to the mark? And then we will come to some reasonable conclusions. The moment I say yoga, it brings different images to different people depending on what is your orientation. It could be meditation or it could be yogasanas or it could be so many things or pranayama. It all comes under the same heading of yoga. Therefore, the, the root definition of yoga means that it is union. What is the union? The union of the body, the mind and the spirit. Are we able to really achieve it? We don't know yet. Okay? But generally, the moment we say yoga, it is equated with yogasanas. That's what normally we think of yoga. And that is problem with that anyway. And this is just one part of yoga actually. Therefore, there are different parts of yoga. But there are different types of yoga which is confusing everybody nowadays. Therefore, the most well known is Hatha Yoga, basically the exercise part. And, but there are other modifications. So that is the biggest advantage of yoga is that you can modify. You have the freedom to modify. And the problem with that is that these modifications, some of them have been even patented. Before, and then you cannot practice it without the license. Some of these have actually made yoga or got yoga a bad name. For there are different types of yogas that you can hear are Sudarshana Kriya Yoga, Iyengar Yoga, Sahaj Yoga, Vinyasa Yoga, Power Yoga, even Heart Yoga, which was pretty popular in the US in the last decade by uh, Bikram. Bik this is also called as Bikram Yoga. Ultimately, he was prosecuted. Therefore, I mean, I'm not joking, it's true. Therefore, some of these things actually have made yoga a brand rather than science and art. Therefore, we need to be really careful as to what we study and what we take home whenever we study anything. And that's what I'm trying to highlight. Now, what I would be mainly discussing, especially in India, is about the Ashtanga Yoga, Patanjali's Ashtanga Yoga, Raja Yoga, which has eight limbs. I won't discuss, most of you already know. But why is there an interest in yoga? Is it only Indian or it is across the globe? So as we can see, there are even big magazines like Time, Time is one of the best magazines, have come out with special editions on yoga. This is from 2001. Okay? And they followed it up with another edition in 2003, how your mindy mind can heal your body. The four. And then again, another version in 2003 about meditation. And as recently as in 2014, there was an issue. Therefore, these are dedicated issues because yoga has gone global even before the establishment of International Yoga Day in 2015. Therefore, there was already a lot of hype about yoga. Now, this is hype. That's what I mean. Therefore, there was not much evidence about that. Therefore, when we look at research findings in yoga, being from the medical background, the first thing that we look at is a, a website called as National Library of Medicine, which is also known as PubMed and it publishes most of the articles, not all the articles. So, if we search for that, by typing yoga for the title, then you get about 8,000 articles as of today. And there are about 1,500 review articles on that. Now, if you slightly modify it and make it a little more stringent, then you get about 7,000 articles if yoga has to be present in title and abstract. Still, it means it's a lot. Now, the earliest article we can find scientifically is from 1948. And even at so early, Lancet is one of the best journals that we have in medical sciences and biological sciences, let's say. And there is an Indian author who has published as early as in 1950. It's not that yoga was not being researched, but at the same time, it didn't get its due credit. And at the same time, later on, the explosion of the research probably hasn't been very beneficial to us. Now, the latest one, as of yesterday, that you can see, the title itself says what it is. The experience of young adults affected by cancer within an eight-week yoga intervention delivered by video conference, a qualitative interview study. Therefore, look at the title itself and then it will tell what type of research is being done in yoga. Therefore, this is a problem that we have. Therefore, you teach them with video conference and then you have evidence based on qualitative parameters. For these two are kind of antithesis. Uh, to scientific uh, data procurement because video conference has its own limitations, all of us know. For this most recent article that was published yesterday in Medline. 
Now, this shows how the yoga research has, or the publications have increased. There has been an exponential growth since the beginning of this century, and that's increasing. When I was starting my MD and post-MD research on yoga, if I search, there were only about 600 articles, starting from 1948, 600. Now, today, if you look at, what we can see is that here, the number of articles is increasing. And if you look at that, in 2018, there were 581 articles in one year. And after that, there was COVID. That actually did not help. Actually, it worsened the situation. Now you can see in 2023, there are 837 articles, which means that there is an explosion of literature after COVID and before that also there is, but doesn't mean that they have, they are all good. It doesn't mean that the quality is good. That's what we will try to look at. And then we'll be able to understand better as to why we are not able to do good research on yoga. Before I started with 600 articles in 2000 when I was doing my MD. Now in, in a year, we get 800 articles. Means every day you're, I'm not able to keep pace with that because every day I get three articles to read. Can I read that? No, I cannot read that. But this is what has been happening. Now what is the quality? We looked at the quantity. Oh, there is enough quantity, 6,000, 8,000 articles and every day you have three new articles. But just because there is quantity doesn't mean that there is quality. Now when we look at the type of journals that these articles are produced and that is a problem. Because when we look at the quality of the journals, mostly what we want is these journals should be indexed in a, web, in a repository called as Medline. And that, that tells us that the quality of the journal, the review process and other things are standardized and they are reputable. But only about 50% of these articles are actually published in Medline index journals, which means that we have 50% of the articles probably don't have much scientific value. Therefore, you are left with only about 4,000 articles. Okay, and therefore, that is how it is happening. And there are a large number of articles in popular press or vanity press. Therefore, there is a popular magazine called as Yoga Journal. And if you hear about this Yoga Journal, you think that it is a scientific journal. Therefore, most of us would believe that it is a scientific journal. No, it is like a weekly magazine or a monthly magazine. It is not a journal. I mean, in the true sense of scientific journal. Therefore, we get articles in these and they carry a lot of weightage because people believe that, thinking that that is the true science and that is not necessarily true. Just because there is a name doesn't mean that it is scientifically valid. Now, even in the scientific journals, when they publish, there are certain biases or conflicts of interest. One example, very good example was in a very reputed journal called as Preventive Cardiology. And the lead author of the publication was the editor of the journal. Now, what do you want to do? Therefore, you are the editor of the journal and you want to publish your own article. Where is the peer review process? Where is the scrutiny of that scientific literature? And I'm not joking. You can go back and see. For these are the problems that we have. And off late, the problem is with predatory journals. Those who are in scientific or research community, we know what are predatory journals. Predatory journals, they will send you emails saying that we want to publish your article. Please send an article. They don't do any quality work. Whatever you send, they will publish. And that is called as a scientific journal. And recently there was an editorial on this as to how the predatory journals are affecting the quality of the research. If you look at the title of this, Keeping Medical Science Trustworthy, the threat by predatory journals. There is a threat. And this, there is a big list of these journals which are predatory journals. I'm just showing only one, Annals of Yoga and Physical Therapy. There are at least six yoga related journals in this list. Therefore, if you look at the articles from these journals, probably there is not much scrutiny of the scientific content of those articles. For we need to be careful about that. For this is about the journals. What about the type of studies? Are they really trustworthy? Now, many articles are basically case reports. There is only one subject who has done yoga and this is the report. Do you believe that? Probably not. He is a different individual. He's just one individual or two individuals. Or there are what are called as case series. There are different cases and they combine and they publish it as an article. For so these are not true signs in the sense of what we want as evidence. Therefore, these are the part articles. If you see such articles, be careful about that. Even if there is large number of people, these people are not properly assigned. We call it as randomization. Therefore, there is no randomization or purely described randomization. One example is that 
a, a investigator wants to study and whoever is willing to come, they will take all of them and that is not the right way of doing it. If I am willing to participate, which means that I already have a bias towards yoga and that type of people are called as self-selected population because I, have, I want to do yoga, therefore I am already pro-yoga and if you do some qualitative studies, how are you feeling today or did you feel this, they will all want to please you because you are the investigator and they want to bring name to yoga and therefore they will say yes. Okay? And that is not true science. Therefore, self-selected population, no randomization, these are biggest hurdles in yoga-related science. Once you have a population, then look at what they have done. Is there any control group which can be matched? Absolutely, in many of the articles, no control group. Or there is inappropriate control group. And there are no matched age or gender matching. Say, for example, many of these yoga-related articles, if you find, Majority of the population is female. Therefore, in, out of 10, there will be 8 women and 2 men. Can we generalize it to men? No, we cannot. There are only 2 men. Therefore, it should have been 50-50 at least, 5 and 5. Therefore, that matching of gender, age-wise also, whatever is effective in a young individual, it is not necessarily beneficial to an old individual. We will have to look at that. These things are lacking in most of the yoga-related scientific literature. We need to be aware of that. And then, what type of yoga intervention has been given? Oh, that is another biggest problem. What we have is highly variable, poorly defined, and unmonitored intervention. Say, for example, if you look at what intervention has been given, they were doing six asanas, three times daily, every time five minutes. Were you monitoring it? No, you are not monitoring it. They said that they were doing it like this for the last three years. Do you believe it? I wouldn't believe it. Because we don't know. Because all these subjects who come to your yoga studies, they will tend to please you. And I should be aware of that. Therefore, these are the major limitations of yoga-related research. And that is why high-quality journals do not accept your articles because they think that your science or the data that you have produced is not reliable. For all these things come together. And the last is, what are the outcomes that we are measuring? For most of the outcomes, say, when you look at yoga researches, I'm, I started feeling better. Now, how do you measure feeling better? Therefore, these are all subjective self-reports. There is no objective way of measuring some of these things. All these are limitations of the type of studies that we are producing. And because of that, good journals will not accept your articles. And therefore, the scientific information that we have is not that trustworthy. I'm not saying all articles are bad. There are best uh, articles that have been published in, say, PNS. Dr. Uh, Srinivas is going to talk about that. Therefore, PNS is one of the highly reputed journals. Yes, we have articles about yoga in that one, plus one. And there are good articles. There are good journals also. But some of these things you can see, this is one article, Efficacy of Yoga, Ayurveda and Yoga in Management of SARS-CoV-2, two case reports. This is one, one article. And the other one is, A Survey of Effectiveness of BKS Iyengar Yoga Plan for Cold. This is another article. These are scientific articles you can see. I am just giving an example without going into the details of who the authors are. For not only the authors, even best of the institutions are producing such crap. Okay? Therefore, we need to be aware of that. I am not justifying anything or at the same time, I am not saying that everybody is bad. Therefore, if these are the problems, why are we not able to uh, produce? Because there are difficulties. What are the difficulties? As Sri M already told, sincere and sustained pursuit of yoga is not easy. I mean, uh, how many of us can consistently do yoga asanas every day for say, forget about years, weeks for example. If we can't do that or it's not easy to do that. The four sincere and sustained pursuit of yoga is not easy. And at the same time, whenever we do any interventions, the training itself is to be blamed. Therefore, we give a short training or very superficial training and they have a lot of questions. We don't answer those questions and therefore, they lose interest and they don't do it. And at the same time, the information that we provide will not be complete. It will not be pragmatic. And at the same time, if you want to do yoga, it takes time. And then time is money now. Therefore, you will have to dedicate some of your time to go to the investigator and all. It costs something for you in terms of money or time and all these things have to be compensated for. Otherwise, nobody will come to yoga research. But this is also a difficulty of yoga. And most of the yogis, as Sri Yam said, they are not very keen on coming to your lab and undergo investigation. They are hours to publicity. I mean, people, they do yoga, they are somewhere in the remote places. So we don't have equipment in those remote places. We will have to bring them here. And that itself disturbs their abhyas or whatever practice. 
and that boosts their ego and they are not willing to do that because that is not the right way in yoga. Therefore, these are some of these limitations of finding a true yogi who can undergo these investigations. So, that is also a problem. And most of the experiences that true yogis have, their attitudinal changes are subjective feelings. Are we able to measure that? The techniques are improving. Say, for example, previously we didn't know that, uh, or we couldn't measure. When I started my MD, there was no way of knowing at the brain thickness. Now we have uh, PET scans, SPEC scans, or there are other ways of measuring neurotransmitters using functional magnetic resonance imaging. Therefore, the techniques are also improving and we are able to do few things, but at the same time, we still have a long way to go. Therefore, looking at all these things, what I would like to say is that, oh, I'm sorry, available data indicate that yoga has beneficial effects on normal human functions and probably in diseases, but additional high quality studies are needed to confirm and further elucidate the potential therapeutic benefits and long term effects. Potential underlying mechanisms need to be further explored. And finally, we also have to look at the risks associated with yoga intervention and that is never addressed in any of the papers. Therefore, that's another thing. Therefore, we need to account for that also. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Manjunath. Uh, that sets the stage for this uh, whole conference. And yeah. uh, uh, since we are running uh, late, so I would request all the participants, delegates to uh, interact with uh, Dr. Manjunath during the lunch and uh, clarify all your doubts. Of course, he has really given the real picture of what is happening in the research in yoga. And that will uh, make you all think about how to go about doing this research. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. once again. Now, uh, the next uh, speaker for a very short session is uh, Professor Gopalakrishnan. Uh, sir will talk on the scope and purpose of this colloquium. Sir uh, will be talking uh, for less than 10 minutes. And Sir, introducing Sir, Professor Gopalakrishnan uh, was a professor of English teaching in uh, different government colleges in the state for the last 30 years after retirement. Sir is also a writer. Sir, uh, after retirement, he is actively involved in civil service training. Uh, training. And also, um, Sir has, is vice president, was vice president for an edtech company. So, I am inviting Sir to give this to give his brief talk on scope and purpose of the colloquium. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, Sri M, of course, in his absence, and my dear friends and scholars, researchers, and scientists who have come here. My idea is not to talk anything like you would be hearing during these two days. But my idea is to connect a few ideas so that you will be engaged in listening to these talks with a, in a more purposeful manner than you would have planned earlier. So my idea is to put you into a kind of a, a spot in a, in a positive sense so that you can connect all these speeches together. Very often, we, we feel that we know something, but in reality, we, uh, we won't know it. I shall give you one example. Can you say when you were born? See, <laughs> I would say I was born in 1955. But then comes the question, how can you be born in one year? It cannot be a 365-day long process. Then I would say I was born on 27th March of 1955. And then comes the question, how could you be born in one day? Then I would say I was born at 4 a.m. on that day. But then comes the pivotal question, you were actually 9 to 10 months old when you were born. So <laughs> when were you born? You know, then that becomes a difficult question. So you are date of birth or your birth actually is a problem that you have to ponder over for a long time. 
somebody asks you what's the time then i would look at my watch and say it is 12:30 12:35 and then uh, the he asks a, dif a slightly different question without the definite article he would say what is time then you are actually you cannot say an answer because nobody knows what actually is time that's the problem with uh, uh, yoga and the natural sciences we don't know the true nature or the truth of these two things so with that background i will just read through a very brief note that i have made for today knowledge is a naughty child one has to chase it to feed it to put it to rest even to control it we think we own knowledge and are even possessive about what we know but knowledge has its own plans like in tennyson's famous poem ulysses every piece of knowledge we acquire is only an invitation to know more it's only a reminder that there is the outside world looming large seductively beckoning now when the international yoga research foundation join hands with rgc regional uh, rajiv gandhi center for biotechnology a regional cancer center and other uh, pioneering institutions for a two day colloquium on yoga and the life sciences to create a new world order we are also admitting ourselves into this chase and knowledge for knowledge to know what is knowledge but perhaps this time we will convert knowledge into wisdom even so that is how the whole program is arranged that is the whole canvas of the program it is so impressive that we feel that we might end up with knowing a few things if not be wiser at the end of the day this time international yoga research foundation and rajiv gandhi center are trying to discover if not yoke together two apparently disparate elements namely yoga and the life sciences one an ancient serene stream of our rich tradition and then the other the gushing waters of the modern world the modern sciences this colloquium attempts to showcase a cascade featuring all these two elements these two uh, these two identity uh, entities when two such streams of knowledge flow forward the modern science has many terms to describe it see when two disparate elements come together the modern science has got many elements to many new terms to describe it the terms are one is the common synthesis and then doctors have another very interesting term called symphysis when two things join together then the famous entomologist edward o wilson has a very interesting term called consilience or the unification of knowledge and then in media circles we have the term called convergence they all mean the same so we are actually aiming at this convergence of two disparate things a synthesis of them but in the process what we are trying to bring about is the fraternity of disciplines we are trying to establish that there is no stranger in the world of disciplines we are trying to establish the truth of interdisciplinarity by bringing together yoga and the life sciences our upanishads say yoga is the way the way out of darkness out of ignorance science is also a way out of darkness both yoga and science talk about what we are especially in relation with the vastness of the universe the famous french philosopher pascal blaise pascal has a very important observation quote i am quoting pascal let man contemplate nature in her full and lofty majesty 
Let him put far from his sight the lowly objects that surround him. Let him regard that blazing light placed like an eternal lamp to illuminate the world. Let the earth appear to him but a point within the vast circuit which that star describes. So Pascal is talking about the smallness of the earth and the minuteness of man like a pinprick on this universe. Now we have to compare this with a very important observation made by the famous Silonese metaphysician Ananda Kumaraswamy in, in one of his very important books called Dance of Shiva wherein he says that when you scale the Himalayas you have two thoughts in your mind. One is, oh my God, how how small I am when I compare myself with the immensity of these ranges. And the second thought is that, in spite of your immensity, I have scaled you. So that is the vision between the East, uh, the difference in vision between the East and the West. One is the vision of submission, and the other is a vision of uh, a, a coherence, a vision of uh, a vision of un not knowing that I am also part of the whole. Whether this be the realization of the immensity or the surrender before immensity, the recent developments in brain research have been able to map a significant range of human experience. Our sense of the union about which we talked about through what we now call yoga stands the chance of explanation that is what the former speaker was trying to talk about, through the study of life sciences, especially the study of the human brain. There is no a chance for it. Now I shall conclude uh, with this poetic description of the human brain by a very famous MIT neuroscientist, computational neuroscience professor called Sebastian Swing. He has brought out a book called Connectome. C-O-N-N-E-C-T-O-M-E. He has made important advances in computer science and neuroscience. Swing's work is called Connectome, <coughs> or the subtitle is How the Brain is How the Brain's Wiring <coughs> Makes Us Who We Are. <coughs> I'm sorry. Uh, can I get some water? Throat is getting dry. Yes. See, uh, Swing is a top notch scientist, but see how beautifully he describes the human brain. I am also an English teacher, I'm, I was fascinated by this description. He's talking about the brain. Let me quote Swing No road. No trail can penetrate this forest. The long and delicate branches of its trees lie everywhere, choking space with their exuberant growth. This forest is majestic, but also comic and even tragic at times. It is all of these things together. Every novel and every symphony Every cruel murder and every act of mercy, every love affair and every quarrel, every joke and every sorrow, all these things come from this forest. Over today and tomorrow, we shall be navigating through the science and unity of knowledge that this forest would represent. It is so relevant and significant that Rajiv Gandhi Center has decided to partner with the International uh, Yoga Research Foundation for a colloquium on the concept of synthesis and coherence, especially at a time when we are being constantly warned by very great uh, social scientists like Yuval Noah Harari that our brains are about to be hacked by the marriage of infotech and biotech. So this is a 
this colloquium comes at a very, very important time. So we have to be aware of that. So my only hope is, may the best of things happen. But as is truly said, when the intention is good, success is certain. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir, for that philosophical elucidation of scope and purpose of the colloquium. Since we are running short of time, we'll take any questions for the session in the, during lunchtime. Thank you. So uh, thank you all for the patient listening. Uh, and with this, I think we will close this session and uh, split for lunch. Lunch will be until 1.45, and it's served the pendal outside. I would request all the delegates to please be back on time, because we are running behind schedule, as you would see. So bon appetit. <laughs>